Hello, dear viewers. Welcome to my channel, Science to Technology. In today's show, Science Thursday, we're going to talk about non-destructive testing. It was a viewer request. So let's dive deep into it. So NDT, non-destructive testing, allows us to know the real condition of objects. Does not matter if it's a small object, big object. It's just object, whatever uh, your not point of interest is, uh, without causing any harm. And you can see inside. Let that be very clear. Of course, you can uh, inspect things. That's how we used to do it. Just by looking at it very closely, then we developed photography. Then you can look photography We're using filters and all that. We did all of that. But here's the deal. All of them are very good, but they cannot tell you what's going on inside. So in those sort of scenarios, we need a way to look inside without causing damage. Like, uh, uh, think in this way. We want to see what's happening in the tree without actually drilling uh, into it. Now, we in the old days, we used to do that, drill it and uh, take out a sample and then study it. But what if you don't want to do that? So that's the whole umbrella ecology of non-destructive testing. It's not one technology. The idea is you study what's going on without breaking the damn thing. That's all you have to do. Like, for example, crash testing is fundamentally destructive testing. You go vabayam in order to figure out how did it happen. And based on that, you uh, fine tune your models and design it and give it crash safety rating and all that jazz. But that's a destructive thing. But let's say, how would you know whether your stuff can last, let's say, 100,000 mile or 10,000 mile or 50,000 kilometers, whatever have you. Uh, for that, you need non-destructive because, again, you have to run your vehicle and then you have to scan it without damaging it. And you may like, Okay, why do we need that? Well, here's the deal. Everything has a life. Everything has a health to it. For example, a metal structure, it's not just a metal structure, it has green substructure inside it. And based on how things are uh, progressing, uh, there will be micro cracks. There will always be cracks. Here's the deal. Are they actually affecting anything or they are just there? Most of the time, they're just there. But as it ages, as it goes through thermal expansion and contraction, as it goes through road bumps and day one, nothing happens. Day 100, something happens. Day 5000, a lot of things have happened. Now you can literally, your chassis, which can handle, let's say, uh, X amount of strength, uh, on day one, it's like, you know, X divided by five. And again, you need to categorize it. So you will like, okay, go drive this car for 1000 kilometers. Okay, now you scan it. That gives you a data point. Go drive this uh, car for 10,000 kilometers. Okay, now you scan it, give a data. And that's how you figure out how the health is degrading. And based on that, you can figure out how long the lifespan of this stuff would be. Same is done for bridges, trains, everything. So basically monitoring health of the structures, items we use in day-to-day -day life. There is no scenario where which you have not uh, used a product or been serviced by an item that has been gone through NDT. You have to. Like any bridge you are driving on, there is a very good chance NDT has, unless it's a very brand new. Like, of course, you do not do it every day. Uh, so you may have to use some uh, enough utensils, enough uh, items, enough planes, enough things go through it that you have used the services of NDT. Now, in terms of principle, think in this way. This is exactly like how medical services work. Basically, same way you put a person in MRI machine. I was put into MRI recently just for my spine issue. I have no idea how the heck people remain so still for that long. Um, again, I didn't know how to do it. It's just painful. Uh, so same thing. Because again, I have a slip disc issue that's inside me. They wanted to see what's going on without actually cutting it open. So that's the same thing. Same way you do X-ray. Same thing, you want to see what's going on without causing damage. Same thing with ultrasound. That's the same principle of healthcare applied on our inanimate objects. So that is NDT, same principle. So the first large umbrella category, sub umbrella, so to say, is radiography. Now radiography generally co uh, consists of two main puppies. One is X-ray, another is gamma rays. Now this allows to see through things without cutting or any sort of infection. And be mindful, these are very high resolution also, meaning how refined um, of a scan you can get is very high. Like you can get things that are so precise that unless there is a fault that is smaller than like, you know, few microns, you can see it. Like you're like, bruh, there is a fault there. It's like very high resolution and um, it allows you to do amazing weld inspection. So let's say you are dealing with a gas pipeline that is a national priority level things, meaning it cannot go oops. And even if you want like, what if I do maintenance and all that, that would be scheduled 10 years later. So you have to get it right and you have to get it right now. How would you do that? Well, you do the welding and then you do X-ray testing on it, meaning you literally take X-ray photographs, study that. And if you find out any fault, you fix it right there because you cannot wait. You cannot just like, ah, let us just run out of that. It's a high priority thing. So whenever you need to have high priority safety or repairs 
those requirements, uh, generally X-ray or gamma rays are preferred. Uh, <clears throat> and again, it allows very fine resolution. You can see all the internal defects, not just like, oh, I think this is like good enough. No, it tells you what is it good enough or not. And radiographic images, be it X-ray or gamma rays, does have one very unique advantage. They are used for QC and held for audits also. For example, let's say you're making a turbine blade. Let's say you are a company, it's like, hey, we're gonna make this turbine blade. How do you get it certified? Well, you have to send it through a QC lab that does this sort of X-ray graphy, and then very high resolution one, and then you give it to ISO standards, and they're gonna verify it, whether it's like good enough or not. And again, uh, it's not done as a like you know point of blame. It's more done like, is it good enough or not? And again, you may think uh, the casting is right, or this is right, or that is right, but how do you know? You see through it, whether it's uh, right or not. And if something still bad happens, let's say you put it in a turbine and it's still melted uh, or uh, like broke off, now you can do a proper investigation. Now you know like, hey, we did through, uh, look through everything and it was third party audited. That means there is something else going on. It is a very exciting thing for, again, as long as no loss of life has happened, a lot of engineers will look into it and it's a very uh, nice learning experience. So that's why for compliance and audits, a lot of X-ray Im images has to be done. For example, think in this way, for drill, they give you a small um, electrical box that has switches and he was like, it's rated for 1 million operation. It's like, how the heck do you know it will last that long? Well, you run it for a machine, go to drrrr, and it's like, okay, then how do you test it? You send it through X-ray and you figure out how much the contacts are there. You must have done your mathematics that contacts are wearing this much. And again, you run it on a testing machine and then you're like, okay, the contact at 1 million, it has worn out this much. At 2 million, it has worn out this much. And th based on that, you create a graph. Sometimes you can really push it until it breaks or sometimes you have to be like, okay, we uh, like we like this device only has to last for 1 million. You certify it for 2 million and then you're like, it's good enough. That's how they do it many times. So radiography, even though it's messy and again, sometimes flat out radioactive X-ray is messy. Uh, gamma rays is just flat out radiation. So there are penalties to that. Cost, risk, uh, all of that is there. Basically cost, it takes a bonkers amount of cost, but it does allow you very high quality of feedback, so to say. So that's the, and again, this is turbine blade and the cooling channels. I, I did not knew this in like, you know, this much complexity goes into the cooling channel. So, and again, engine blocks also, a lot of things can be done. Then we come to ultrasound. Now, most of you are familiar with it. There is a very good chance ultrasound has been used on your body. So same thing is done on everything, especially if you ride on railways. I'm pretty sure your railway track has gone through this. Maybe not this exact machine, but absolutely guaranteed ultrasound machine has gone over it. So it's a very high frequency sound. Now, ultra simply means above our hearing ability. So meaning, um, let's say 30 kilohertz or above. So very high. And again, it's not necessary to be only 30 kilohertz. It could be in megahertz also. So very high frequency. And uh, we send it into items and we uh, basically map out the echo. It's basically radar or sonar to be more precise. It's uh, basically like that. And it does allow you to see internal defects and all that, corrosion, erosion also, because it has to, many times you have, a, let's say a pipe and you are sending some viscous fluid, let's say crude oil, and uh, crude oil is not clean enough, let's just say, and it has like particulates and all that, it's eroding. Day one, nothing will happen. Day 500, there's something will happen. And if it's like um, eroding too much, you need to know without stopping the pipeline, without uh, cutting open the pipeline. Ultrasound is like, I got you fair. And sometimes it can be done while it's running, pipeline, not railway, pipeline. So all of those things allows ultrasound to be a very useful tool and it's very portable, radiation free. Uh, so it's very good in that regard. However, it does not give images. Now let that be clear, that's not the limitation of ultrasound. We use ultrasound in medical field that gives you images, but whenever you're talking about in structures, uh, they generally give you a graph like this. So while you can store the graph and it has been used for investigation and all that, it's generally not that sort of fidelity where it's like, no, this is exactly how it is and all that. So it's good, but no CRs. But more than good enough for uh, more than enough critical infrastructure that unless it's like a nuclear reactor where it's like no oopsie is allowed, you will be more than fine enough. Like you will be served well enough with these things. And yes, nuclear reactors are generally used uh, because let's say graphite blocks. How do you know the graphite blocks is actually good? It's dense. How do you know? you X-ray the hell out of it. You gamma ray the hell out of it. Because as once the reactor turns on, it gets into neutron poisoning. At that point in time, you can't touch it. You cannot do anything about it. So it has to go in perfect. How do you know the, the, all the concrete wall is absolutely perfect? How do you know all the vessel wall is perfect? That's how you do it, X-ray and all that. There you will not do ultrasound. There you will be like, brah, we have to pony up for X-ray. So ultrasound is a very good tool, a very ch portable, cheap, radiation free, all of that, but does not give you an image. That is the penalty and getting a 3D image out of it, eesh, too complex.
another aspect is while those things are good for structures you have to understand majority of things spin on planet earth so a tool purpose built for spinning things we call vibration diagnostics basically the whole wide world like you have jet engine it's a spinning thing you have power plant turbines it's a spinning thing a railway axle it's a spinning thing your engine block lot of spinny things so most of things have spinny things and especially if you can handle motors you can handle majority of human civilization so that shall know how the motors are working well <coughs> how motors are behaving it will create a sound to it now again that sound does not have to be in uh, human audible range it could be infrasound meaning below our hearing range at very low hum or it could be ultrasound where it's like very high frequency so all of that would be there so motor is screaming 24 into 7 and based on that screaming you can figure out how it's working now if it is unbalanced the screaming will change if it's a bearing is about to fail it will change if it has loose mount let's say the mount was there the bolts corroded and it started to become a bit loose from optical inspection it may not be very obvious but it's it's about to give so to say that will be loose mount vibrations and then you have misalignment like let's say something earthquake like happened and then shaft give like again it's still spinning and it's doing like this now okay exaggerated but you get the point the shaft is not precisely aligned all of them and coil failure like let's say you have a three phase motor or six phase motor uh one phase is just like misbehaving it will have a different kind of whine to it so to say now each uh, fault has a unique signature that's the most advantage uh, this technology has because it's basically screaming exactly what's wrong with it it's not like something is wrong it's like bro bearing is about to go bro shaft is missing line bro i am loose so all of that is, that is there and nowadays because again uh, motors are the heart of human civilization uh, thus you are getting a sensor package that's just like mount it in your motor and get in your app data and again it will tell you it's like yeah you can watch the graphs and all that and again if you are a technician you have to know how to read the graphs but nowadays you can just like you, computer analyze it is like yeah bro you everything is good uh and wait until next uh, cycle and next cycle is like yeah now it's time to schedule a I mean schedule downtime for bearing regreasing or bearing replacement generally that's the first thing that happens if something else could happen like earthquake and all that that could cause misalignment or uh, uh, you know uh, loose mountings but those are rare now each of this fault signature is so distinct so unique it is a very critical tool for routine checkups like you heard the term preventive measurement uh, preventive maintenance what does that mean that simply means uh, um, let's say once a week or once a month that's the maximum duration you have to do it between these days so once a week or once a month and again nowadays because we have so much advanced electronics we just mount a sensor there but if you do not you have lot of motor you will have a technician going with the handheld instrument and scanning every single motor and you basically scan where the bearing body is that and again there has to be certain uh, protocols you cannot just put it on chassis itself it has to have a very specifically down the plane and uh, if you want to do this generally whenever you buy the brand new motor they will be have, big motors have a spot it's like put the sensor here if it does not you grind a spot and then you put it there like basically if it's a bearing block there and you do not have a spot you have to grind a spot clean it i mean clean the clean yf out of it put certain uh, they will give you a certain type of cement put that put the metal box there because again you want to make sure all the high frequency travel without attenuation because if you do not hear that high frequency which is very easy to attenuate heck even rust get attenuated yeah then it's useless deaf so to say it's a audio sensor so to say so it does need to hear the wide range so that's why it's a very dedicated thing and those pucks the pucks have to be very precisely mounted precisely not would be the right word very robustly mounted with high enough bandwidth that low frequency travels high frequency travels and everything in between travels without getting attenuated or reflected backwards so so this can actually work it's a bit of a hell work or buy a from a brand like let's say abb they will give you the package itself it's like bro everything is integrated don't worry about it uh, so that's that's how we do preventive maintenance that's how we can know it's like hey we have this 10000 motor under our care motor number 5 is like about to sneeze let's uh, shut it down for preventive maintenance before something bad happens because as you bad bearing is just a minor issue bad bearing becomes destroyed bearing then it becomes a massive issue so vibration diagnostic is a very critical tool for well everything that spins which translates to everything so bluetooth app now let that be very clear when i talked about this being an umbrella term it is a freaking umbrella term there's many 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 more like a few of the popular ones are eddy current systems now generally it is not preferred because it does have that if you um 
if it's perfectly aligned the crack let's just say it's perfectly aligned to the magnetic flux it will not show up but most time it does show up and that's why they are generally uh, trained that you must have uh, basically do it one axis then you do it another axis so flux alignment uh, does not mask any issue uh, then you have a, like you know iron filing very small specific particle size for that and that will clump up and you will see some fault is there uh, different variants of this is where you have a glow in the dark dye and that dye has like very fine particulate size and that will go into even micron size cracks and then you put in a um, glow in the dark chamber and it's like voila all the cracks all the failures is like da da so that's there while it does go from surface to deep but does not go very deep so it's like if you're doing this on a pipe you're not gonna see inside the pipe that's why we go to ultrasound or x-ray then you have uh, eddy current uh, system eddy current is a bit more uh, involved and again it has its pros and cons uh, people sometimes prefer it for metal structures uh, so that is there thermal based uh, thermal camera based again it's a super easy to understand but be mindful whenever you're talking about thermal based system it assumes you have a baseline because if you do not know what you're looking at hot things does not mean it's catching on fire for example many of the motion control cabinets for big motors have brake resistors in there and if motor applied braking, while you are looking at it, it will look like it's catching on fire because again, it's a brake resistor. It's like, whoosh, it's a heating element, so to say. So you do need to know what is the optimum condition, running condition versus the fault condition. However, because it's a 2D plane and image and it goes through our visual cortex, it's surprisingly easy. Like I can show you something and you're like, no, no, that part is broke. You will figure it out. It's surprisingly intuitive. Like for some reason, our optical cortex is like, bro, I'm the Jaya. So that's a really good tool. We do not even consider it as like a diagnostic. It's like, even though it's the most effective one, even for solar panels, like you can just go, ah, yep, that cell is about to be cooked. So let's replace this panel. Super easy, reliable. We don't even consider it. That's how awesome it is. And uh, my personal favorite, low cost, uh, rebound hammer testing. For example, let's say you bought an apartment. How the heck you know the concrete pillar is actually concrete pillar, like, like you know, not made out of tofu drake project, Chinese material. Uh, you can buy this sort of hammer. Again, not very cheap, but again, your life. So this hammer has a spring tension, very ca well calibrated spring tension and very calibrated mass and goes wabam. Now, going that wabam, that's the one thing that does not tell you anything. It just bounces back from it. Based on the density, based on the how concrete is there, there is a chart. You get a number, you put that number into a chart, basically how thick the concrete pillar is, how depth it is and all that. And voila, you know how good the concrete pillar is. A very uh, low uh, grade system, but again, more than good enough to tell you some either you need to evacuate or not. Because again, if this is starting to show you an error, a lot of things have gone bad. And again, it does show degradation. Basically, if let's say uh, rebar is corroding inside, it will start to show. So it's a very useful tool, not a very high precision tool, but more than good enough. And some things that, uh, you know, house inspectors can carry and do carry sometimes to like validate concrete structures and many more tools let that be very clear you're like what if we use laser man yeah all optical systems rely on lasers man so anything you can think of i can guarantee you somebody has used it for ndt uh, non-destructive testing i can guarantee you that there are a very specific tool only made for this tool and there are very complex tool that has like five six processes it's a whole ecosystem and one good news is that this field is very open to public meaning if you want to like if you are not sorted like what are you going to do in like um, job wise and all that in as less as six months of training you can actually get into this field and only college um, school diploma is needed like surprise this field is surprisingly open to public like you want to you go you go into college and uh, enroll into this diploma and you're like yeah you actually get certified you actually can start a career into this and demand wise this is one of those things where it's like demand never dies actually keeps going up like linearly keep going up and you're like what about ai and all that yeah i still need someone to actually carry the damn thing so sorted Unless you are working for Boeing, Boeing will be like, what if we fire the safety engineers? So Boeing, go away. But everybody else, they hire more and more people. Of us. So it's it's a very lucrative field. If you are unsure like what to do, might as well look into it. Because the world needs it. Especially Boeing. So this was my presentation of non-destructive testing. Hopefully you have liked it, learned from it. In that case, please hit the like button, share it amongst your friends, that will help me a lot. If you didn't like it, didn't enjoy it, I urge you to press dislike, press it twice to show me extra disappointment. Please leave a comment because I do try to reply to all of them. Subscribe, press the bell icon if you're free, and as always, thanks for watching.